While one black hole has swallowed something else, a monster has been detected from the early universe. It's a Talking Science Story of the Week. Dr. Brad Tucker and I dive into it right now. With the latest science and space news, five days a week across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is Talking Science with Dr. Brad Tucker and Mac Miller. And Brad, next up on our story of the week agenda, black holes and a couple of stories uh, in this one uh, this week. Uh, first up, it's a black hole around the tw- around 23 times the size of the sun has swallowed something much smaller. It, something is, is the key word here. Uh, you know, we know we've been detecting lots of uh, gravitational waves. So these are collisions between two black holes. We've also collected two neutron stars collide. We've also collected or detected a black hole and a neutron star colliding. Now, the question is, in this case, we know there is another thing, but we can't tell based on the size whether it was a very small black hole or a very big neutron star. So in short, when a big star collapses and the inside squeezes down uh, to form uh, to compress the inside of the star, it either forms a neutron star, or if it's big enough, it forms a black hole. And we don't know in this case which one it is. We know that there is uh, a boundary, that there is a limit, um, and that limit is around it's about two and a half for a neutron star. And then you're getting up to about four for a black hole. So this is times the mass of our sun. So two and a half versus four. This one appears to be at 2.617 times the mass of our sun. So right in that boundary where I either doesn't exist or we just don't know which one it forms. So it's quite a, a very interesting discovery. And the discovery was made by the LIGO and Virgo detectors uh, in August last year uh, with research from scientists at the uh, at, at your university, the National University down there in Canberra. That's right. You know, and, and Australia has a big part in the, in the LIGO gravitational wave uh, search. And this is one of the big goals of it is understanding the mass and ranges of these very compact, massive objects. We, we just have never really been able to observationally or experimentally detect before. And, you know, this kind of goes back to a very big part of theory about how stars live and die, which is what exactly I work on. And and that is where, you know, when do you form what? And by finding this, what we call this mass gap object, the one in in the gaps between the two limits, it's really going to start putting a picture on exactly, you know, the, the exact physical limitations of what happens to stars, just as we know that, you know, some stars uh, can explode if they get exactly 1.38 times the mass of our sun. You know, these things are things that we can physically calculate and then go and detect. And this is what it's going to tell us about uh, neutron stars and black holes. Well, the ANU SkyMapper telescope scanned the area of space where the waves were detected from. Uh, Couldn't find any visual clues, though. No, that's right. And and again, that kind of gives us a you know, maybe a hint. We do know that if a black hole collides with a neutron star, it's likely to give some burst of light. We know when two neutron stars explode, uh, they they explode and we can see it. But it is a very big blind search where uh, you're looking at lots and lots of area and you may never see it. So uh, even though we didn't see it, it doesn't mean we would have seen it. Well, our other story here in in this overall story of of, uh, black hole discoveries, uh, a massive quasar has been discovered uh, in the early universe. What exactly is a quasar, Brad? Quasars are essentially what we call quasi-stellar objects, which is a fancy way of saying gigantic black hole and small galaxy. (laughs) You know, we can't really say GBHS. G, but There's those acronyms again. Exactly. <laughs> Essentially, these are galaxies, uh, some of the earliest galaxies. Uh, so they're younger galaxies, so the galaxy overall, overall is small, but they're dominated by a very supermassive black hole. So the black holes are usually relatively very big compared to the size of the galaxy. They're very active, so they're swallowing lots of things, doing lots of things, spitting out lots of things. Uh, and because of their that they're so early in the universe and they're so big, it tells us a lot about how quickly black holes can grow because those small ones, as we just talked about, will eventually keep colliding to form the big ones. And so by seeing how big, how early you can get, 
kind of puts an understanding of what's happening in the beginnings of the universe. And as you say, they're quite active. In fact, they're the most energetic objects in the universe. Um, but we're not still not quite sure where they first appeared in in the cosmic history. That's right. You know, we we know it took time to form things. After the Big Bang, we had elements floating around and atoms, and that eventually took time to form stars. There's a gap where we call it the Dark Ages, where there's a period for a hundred, couple hundred million years before the first stars actually form. And then it takes time for those stars to explode and start turning into galaxies and things like that. So there's just kind of a time limit where you just need time to form things. And um, this is one of the big questions. When do these things arise and how quickly and how long? And also then how big can you get how early? And by finding a, another really, really big black hole really, really early helps put another piece in limitation of how fast these black holes can grow. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce uh, the Hawaiian name that has been given to this supermassive black hole that's been discovered. Can you help me out here, Brad? No, I, look, I, I have not been able to hear a good pronunciation of it. But it, it is in trying to keep with uh, some of the spirits that we're trying to do, and that is pay homage and respect to the traditional owners of the land where we use our telescopes, whether that be in Australia uh, or Hawaii. So I thought it was a, a, an appropriate choice. Absolutely, and I, and I don't want to be culturally insensitive to even attempt the pronunciation, but it does mean in English uh, and the unseen spinning source of creation surrounded with brilliance. Uh, I think that is that is absolutely perfect, and I love the fact that the Hawaiian culture has a name for these sort of things. It is. It is as I said, it, it, it's, you're right. It's a beautiful choice, and you're right. I, I don't want to horrifically butcher the name um because I, I haven't heard anyone say it so i haven't tried to repronounce it yet unfortunately all righty brad well that is well uh, and of course if anyone from hawaii or, or knows how to pronounce this is watching or listening to us we'll leave a comment uh, and uh, and and then we can uh, we can learn uh, which is what we're here for brad uh, talking science story of the week thanks for bringing this one to us and uh we've got another one tomorrow yep